Hello and uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone in the Success Book Club, wherever you are. And I am absolutely delighted to uh, welcome my guest that I have here today, Eric Macron. So first of all, Eric, welcome. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about you. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Richard. Thanks. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Thanks for inviting me uh, into your club for, uh, for an hour or so. You are so welcome, and I cannot wait to get in and explore this book. But first of all, I just want to read uh, just a real quick uh, biography of yourself. I think that'll make things a bit easier. So okay. Eric has had a multitude of lives in this lifetime. As a world traveler, he was a foreign correspondent while living in Rome, translated for relief doctors during a cholera epidemic in Nicaragua, and was once forcibly expelled from the nation of Laos. He was worked as a tour guide, a radio host, a bouncer, and as a Silicon Valley software executive. But now on to what we're going to talk about today is The Reincarnationist Papers. It's his first novel, which has now been adapted into the Paramount Pictures film Infinite, starring Mark Wahlberg, which is due to be released in May this year, 2021. I've read the book. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's a major page turner. So Eric, thank you so much for, uh, for being with us. How are you? I'm well. Uh, I'm well. Man, that sounded great. Uh, in fact, I, I might ask you to repeat that again at the end of this because that <laughs> felt so good to hear that. Yeah, I'm, I'm great, Richard. And it's, it's so good to, uh, to, to, to see your face and to, uh, and to talk with you about this. And, and to talk not just about the book and the movie and the journey that I've been on, but also the success tricks that I use every day and that I've used uh, that I believe have helped me get this far, because uh, yeah. I think they're valuable to others. Yeah, perfect. Though so That's a big, big part of it. And what so attracted me was obviously the book itself. The story is absolutely fantastic. But also what is so interesting to me is actually how you got the book to become a movie. So I think that bit for, for the audience in the Success Book Club will be highly interesting. But first of all, I think we should maybe talk about the book itself and the okay. content. So tell me a bit about that. How did the book come about, the story? Give us a little bit of a snapshot of what it's all about. So, so the book, without any spoilers, the <laughs> book is about a, a troubled young man in Los Angeles who is haunted by memories of two past lives. And, and, those, and, and, and those, those, that, that, that haunting is complete recall of those past lives. Skills, loves, languages, losses, everything. It's as though he has the memories of three people in his head. And he thinks that he's alone in this world until he abs until he accidentally stumbles upon another woman who's exactly like him and her name is poppy and poppy recognizes his struggle because she's exactly like him except she's even older she remembers seven past lives with complete recall and then here's the plot twist she turns evan's world upside down when she invites him into a secret society of others like them that have reincarnated over and over again and have been associating with one another centuries after century. And then uh, Evan has to pass their tests in order to become accepted into this secret society called the Cognomino. And that's the book. Brilliant. Yeah, fantastic. And <laughs> tell us a little bit about the history. Like, how did this come about for you? Did you write books before this or how did that all come about? Yeah. yeah. So, so I've, um, at university, I studied uh, literature, Russian literature. Um, so, you know, so I have a background with all of the, all of the, all of the giants, the Dostoevsky's, the Tolstoy's, the Turgenev's. And uh, I'd written a lot of short fiction. Uh, I'd worked um, uh, as uh, a reporter doing some features for the Denver Post. Uh, I'm joining you from Denver, Colorado today. Um, and I'd written uh, a, a couple of tour guide books when I lived in Europe and when I worked as a correspondent for UPI, the Newswire, when I lived in Rome. And um, I'd always wanted to write um, larger works like this, novel-length fiction. 
And then this idea came to me from, from, from two different places. Number one, I think we've all had this feeling, Richard, or we've all said this to ourselves or heard other people say this. Oh my gosh, I'm 50 years old. If I only knew when I was 20, what I knew, what I know when I'm 30 or 40 or 50 or 60, oh my gosh, I'd make, I'd made the, I'd made the right decisions. I'd be rich. I'd be successful. I'd be whatever. For sure. So then I took that to its logical conclusion. Well, what happened? What would happen if you could actually have a lifetime's worth of that wisdom and experience as an 18 or 20 year old? What would that character look like? What would those characters look like? And that was one part of the genesis of the book. And the second, which gets into questions about spirituality, which we might touch on later, is I actually have three memories that don't belong to me. And I don't know what to do with them, but they're there. They, they predate my birth in 1967. Um, and they're very short. They're just little fragments. I call them little memory shards. And that sort of always had me thinking, well, is there more to it than this life? Do we get to live again? Why do I have these memories that don't belong to me? Um, and then marrying those two ideas together was the genesis of the reincarnationist papers. Brilliant. Love it. And for me, definitely one of the things that I most enjoyed about the book, other than, you know, the story itself is, is just brilliant. The two characters coming together and the, the relationship that develops there is, is amazing. But for me personally, was what you've just mentioned there was the challenge to my thought that I had spirituality and also as some people will know in terms of you know my habits behaviors you know whatever I was really really interested in how that affected their habits in their next lives as it were all the experiences that they had and it, some of them lived extremely hedonistically because they realized morals were out the window anything goes we're coming back in the next life there's no heaven we're not going to be punished. Um, so I find all of that really, really interesting and how I've often, and I think this is probably a question as well, and I suppose we can talk about this. You know, I've often asked myself, you know, perhaps when I had bad habits, let's say, where have these come from? Where have these habits come from? And yes, you can see the childhood element involved in that, but I've always kind of questioned, you know, is there more to it than that? What's your kind of take on that? Well, um, yeah, this is a great question. There's a lot in there to give us to talk about. Uh, but I'm going to relay one uh, little, little anecdote from um, the last time I was in the UK. And the last time I was in the UK was to go on set to see the, the Paramount Pictures film Infinite, which is the adaptation of the Reincarnation's Papers being filmed. And I struck a conversation with the director. Uh, his name is Antoine Fuqua. He's directed uh, some movies that you might be familiar with, Equalizer movies, uh, Training Day, um, the Magnificent Seven remake, uh, brilliant artist and just a, a fantastic human being. And uh, he'd read the book, obviously. And, and he, he had the same questions. He's like, you know, when you go someplace, and you just recognize it and you feel like you've been there before, or you pick up a new skill or a musical instrument or a tool or something else, and you feel like you just know how to do it or you've done it before, where does that come from? Does that come from some residual memory, from some memory shard that you might have from a previous experience, a previous incarnation? I don't know. I'm not, you know, I, I'm not really super philosophical and, and, uh, and metaphysical about that, but it does beg a lot of questions that we don't have ready explanations for. No. No. Um, so <clears throat> in the book, um, there are characters who really sort of fall into a couple of different buckets. There are ones that realize rather quickly, it doesn't matter if you're, if, if, if you just reincarnate and you reincarnate over and over and over again, and you just remember that. And it doesn't matter if you were 
uh, a villainous person in the previous life or a virtuous person in the previous life. You just keep coming back. At that point, right, like you said, morality can go out the window. Mm -hmm. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to ask the question, how would you live your life if you didn't have any moral boundaries at all? Mm -hmm. Would you be a hedonistic person that was only interested in gratifying yourself? Would you be an altruistic person that was focused on others and helping others? Would you focus on, um, on trying to find some spiritual meaning where there were no moral boundaries? And I think that those are really interesting questions to ask ourselves as readers and as human beings. And I wanted to use these characters with sort of the volume turned up to 11 for these characters to pursue some of those things. Um, and, 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 I, and I hope that I was successful in that. And I definitely came to an answer to that question, funny enough. <laughs> okay. Like for sure. So my answer to that question was, and I suppose, you know, in a, in a lesser scale, I could see some of my life in the, the hedonisms type stuff. Not, now, don't get me wrong, nowhere near what they were up to. And I don't want to give away any spoilers. But to the same token, I suppose you read it and you think, wow, that all sounds really fun for a while. Right. You know, for a while. And I suppose my conclusion was, yeah, maybe for similar to what most of us do, we have a hedonistic, maybe late teens, early 20s, maybe late 20s. But then most people in their 30s kind of go, you know what, I've had enough of that life. Let's, let's kind of settle down as, as would be the kind of societal phrase for it. So I think for me, it would be quite similar. Maybe you'd have a life of complete and utter hedonism but then you'd kind of question, is there more to this? You know, I kind of feel a bit tired of this. And yeah, I think then you would, me personally, I, I would probably explore, you know, what's this really all about, you know? So I find the characters in that very, very interesting, for sure. It's really good. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it was the same for me, maybe a little longer for me. I think I went into my uh, late 20s, early 30s on that phase. Well, it's longer for me too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, yeah, no, but yeah, I think we all know people that are still doing that in their 40s and 50s, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, and some people that's really where they're at and, and what's important to them. Um, yeah. uh, but, but most of the characters eventually you know, kind of grow out of that and, and start to pursue, you know, other, uh, other more deeper, meaningful things. Hey, what does this, what does this life mean for us? Right. If we keep yeah. coming back, what's the purpose of that? Yeah. Yeah. Really, really interesting. So obviously it could, it could be easy to give away spoilers. I don't want to do that. It's so good. It's good. <laughs> Got to read the book first. Yeah, exactly. That's just going to say, I really encourage people to, to read the book. Now, one of the other things that I really enjoyed about the book and my own imagination going with it was the fact that I now know that it's been made into a movie. So the whole way along, I was playing with this idea, you know, I wonder what this is going to look like in the movie. I wonder what that, the setting, and I have a whole image in my mind of the set and everything going on. So I'm really excited to see how that pans out. So can you tell us a little bit, you know, I'm really interested about your story personally when did you decide that it was going to make, be made into a movie and how did all that unfold? Well, I, I didn't get to decide that. I, I, what I did was I, I, I had the opportunity and, and the inspiration to do some things that, that sort of got it there. And, and this really is, is like the first real success type topic around this story. So I wrote the book. And I shared it with, with readers and like you, right? Uh, the readers loved it, really resonated with the story, really you know, engaging on multiple levels. But I took it around to uh, uh, literary agents and publishers in the United States. And while they liked it as individual readers, they had a hard time imagining right, how it would sell. Is it a fantasy book? Is it a mainstream book? Is it historical? fiction, right? So they had a hard time sort of putting it in the right box. And, and they eventually passed on, which is not unusual if you've, if you've ever talked to writers before, right? It's very, very difficult to break in. And so I decided that I would self-publish the book. And I did it 
because I believed that my readers were right, that, that the book is good and should see a wider audience. And then it was a chance reading of, uh, of an author who uh, you've probably read in your, in your success club, uh, Robert Kiyosaki. Not, not yet, um, but we will be for sure. And I'm very rich dad, with poor work. dad. Yep. Um, you know, it, it actually got me into real estate investing as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and he actually has a podcast, which is uh, really good. Uh, I, I recommend that you maybe put that into the rotation for what you guys take a look at um, over there. For sure. uh, but it was a chance reading of his book. And it was a real it was an anecdote in his book. He he relayed a story where, you know, he's a he's a professional speaker and you know, he wrote this series of books with his valuable lessons. And he goes around speaking all over the place. And he was being interviewed by a journalist, and the journalist is talking with him uh, sort of offline. And the journalist says, you know, hey, you're so successful. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I do this interview with you, but I've written a few books. And you know, everybody says the books are good enough. The quality is there, they're entertaining, the characters are engaging, but I'm having a hard time getting published. And Kiyosaki said to her, well, what you, you know, it sounds like you focused enough on the art. What you need to focus on now is the marketing. Yeah. And I heard that and I was like, wait a second, that can't be right. That can't be right. No, it's Michelangelo didn't have to market his stuff right? (laughs) Raphael didn't have to market his stuff. It's good enough that everybody should see it and it should be apparent. That's not true. That's not true. Entertainment is a business and you have to, you know, it's, you you have to play the game and part of the game is the marketing. And so what I decided to do is to focus very hard on Kiyosaki's advice and focus on the marketing. And what I did is I, so I borrowed a page from Kiyosaki and then I borrowed another page from my day job. My day job, as you read from my bio, thank you, Richard, is as a Silicon Valley executive. Uh, I work uh, today at the Oracle Corporation, um, database software, business software, Larry Ellison, you might've heard of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, um, active in the yacht industry, right? Yeah, sure, America, Richard. America's Cup, yeah. Yeah, Ameri- yeah one America's Cup, um, yeah. you know, uh, huge sailor. Yeah. Um, but it, at Oracle, right, we, we develop software uh, for businesses all over the world. And one of, the, one of the development paradigms for software is something called crowdsourcing. Yeah. And this is a Silicon Valley technique where you empower your users or your end consumers to either give you feedback or to do some activity that advances the development of the product. So I decided to crowdsource my readers with marketing. So what I did is I put a reward on the first page of the book. And the reward was to any reader who read the book and loved the book and would be able to introduce the book to a New York publisher, to a Hollywood producer who would see the work into wider release to hit a wider audience. And the reward would be basically the same fee that an agent would make for brokering that same deal. And then by doing that, I crowdsourced all of my readers to be an army of agents for me. And then I published the book and priced the book as low as I could to get it into as many people's hands as I possibly could. And Richard, this sounds like the zaniest message in a bottle marketing plan right up until it works. Yeah. Yeah. Then it doesn't sound zany at all because it was about a year, almost a year and a half later, I got an email from a, a junior Hollywood executive who had been traveling between uh, movie projects. And he found a copy of the Reincarnationist Papers in a hostel in Kathmandu, Nepal. Wow. How random is that, right? You talk about visualization and and, uh, affirmations and making things happen, right? So so his name was Rafi Krohn. Rafi found the book in a hostel in Nepal, read it, loved it, emailed me, and said, hey, is this reward still available? 
And I said, yes, it is. And he's like, Eric, I'm totally going to get this made into a movie. Yeah. Um, I was very excited at first. And then my enthusiasm tempered a little bit later in the afternoon. I'm like, you don't even know this guy. You know, can I, could I ask Eric, what, what year would that have been approximately? That was 2010. Yeah. So I self-published the book in early 2009 and this was, or middle 2009. And this was uh, November, 2010 that Rafi emailed me mm -hmm. and, and Rafi started to work on it. And it went to, uh, it went to a few other places in Hollywood first and they, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, hired a screenwriter to write this and that. And then it, it bounced around and eventually uh, he got it placed with, um, with a production company called Bellevue Productions. And they gave me the first movie option for the novel, which felt amazing to actually have professionals in Hollywood invest wow. in you as an artistic creator. And that was John Zalzirny uh, at Bellevue Productions. And John hired a screenwriter named Ian Shore, uh, who and Ian and I have subsequently become friends. Uh, and Ian Shore wrote the adapted screenplay Infinite. And Ian and uh, John took it out and sold it to Paramount, uh, they actually took it out to all of the major studios and Paramount came back same day and said, we wanna buy it. We don't want anybody else to be able to bid on it. And now that took a few years, that was 2017, yeah. but that's how it happened was really number one, listening to an expert, listening to a mentor like Kiyosaki, right? Who has messages for all of us. Even if it's just a throwaway line or a little anecdote in his larger book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And then thinking about what tools you have available to, you know, to think creatively, right? And, and I had, you know, this, this crowdsourcing paradigm that I'd used before, and I married those two together. And then I used a lot of visualization and a lot of affirmation and followed a lot of the speakers and the, uh, the authors that you probably follow with your group uh, in the UK. And this is how it happened. And how, can I ask, how did that actually look, the affirmations? What was your practices around that? So um, it's a combination of a couple of things. I'm a huge fan of Tony Robbins. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he's, I just, I, it, it would take us a long time to catalog all the lessons that I've received from Tony Robbins, mm -hmm. but there's another author that's, uh, an older author, a little more obscure, but, um, it was introduced to me by, uh, by a friend named Bill Hahn, um, and who's an actor in the United States. And he uses this as well. Uh, a man by the name of Neville Goddard. Uh, yeah. You might be familiar with him. Yeah, definitely uh, and, love him. Absolutely and, love it. And, and his cornerstone work is, is feeling is the secret. And, and, you know, you've got to actually feel it. You've got to internalize what that success feels like to you, not just what it looks like, not just visualizing it, but absolutely feeling it internally. That has something to do with the subconscious mind that always just takes those things in and believes them as real doesn't have that real critical filter that our conscious mind does. And then these amazing things start to happen. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. So, so, so every night before I go to bed, I visualized, uh, you know, seeing this movie being made, uh, you know, getting the, getting the, um, you know, finding a champion like Rafi Crone, who would be the, the person that I was searching for through the reward process to readers uh, finding the person who would first give me the option on the, on, on, on the book, uh, on the reincarnation papers, like John says, did yeah. by finding Ian Shore, who would, uh, who would write a screenplay that Paramount would want. And then a lot of prayer and a lot of visualization, a lot of feeling, uh, using the Goddard techniques around feeling what that would be like, even to the point of feeling what it would be like to go on set, to see the movie being shot. And the feeling that I would have, this one's still yet to be manifest, the feeling that I would get on what it's going to feel like to step onto the red carpet in Hollywood for the movie premiere. Wow. Um, and, you know, this is, this is, I feel this is quite, every evening. I feel chills even thinking about that myself. That's amazing. <laughs> so 
Yeah, so I have a question for you, which we often get asked, and I, and I suppose the personal development world will, will, anybody will often get asked this. So um, you published the book 2008. Uh, it finally, stuff started to happen like nine years, like it took to 2017 yeah. before that really started happening. So the big question is, did you ever, or not so much did you ever, when the doubts came in about, you know, is this going to happen? Is it worth it? Or I suppose if they did come in, what did you do about that? Like, how did you keep going? Well, I would love to say that I'm the guy who carried the little flame burning every day and never let it go out or never let it be extinguished. But that's not true. Uh, you know, I'm a human being, right? I, I have feelings, I have hopes, I have aspirations. And it was not always a bright and sunny day. Uh, there were days when I thought, well, this is just not going to happen for me, right? And I, you know, we, we all have that. We're all human beings, right? We all, we all aspire to be a better version of ourselves. Um, and I was not that better self every day. Uh, and there were many points along the curve where it looked like the movie was going to happen, not going to happen, going to happen, not going to happen. It was going to have this actor and then that actor. It was going to have this director and then that director. And I just kept at it. I just kept trying to be pos positive. I tried to um, continue to do the Goddard visualizations. Uh, I continued to write. And thank goodness I have the second book that is 98% uh, done. That was one uh, of my big questions the, at the yeah. end. <laughs> <laughs> the sequel to the Reincarnationist Papers, yeah. uh, which um, you know we're hope to bring out sometime in 2021 or 2022. Uh, and there are other books in the series as well. So stay tuned for those out there. Um, you know, yeah, there are days when it's rough. There are days when, you know, it just beats you down and you get like one rejection after another. Um, and it, it's okay to quit for a day, yeah. for two days, right? Love it's it. not okay yeah. to quit and stay quit, right? Love it. You've got to, you've got to hold on to that and you've got to see it through. And, you know, I'm the, I'm the 10 or 15 year overnight success story. Brilliant. Love it. And it's so interesting. I literally had a message right before this call from somebody who actually did a workshop just today. And their question was, how long is it going to be before I see success? <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'll definitely be pointing them in the direction of this interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it. it can take a while, right? It can take a while. <laughs> yeah, so uh, no, that's absolutely amazing. I love Neville Goddard as well, absolutely fantastic. And that's one of the things my, my mentor, who I, who I work quite closely with now, definitely patience is something she preaches a lot, you know, patience, patience, patience. So I yeah. love it. I just love that whole story. Yeah, yeah, thank you. The other thing that I always keep in mind, and I actually have it written on my desk here, if you're like me, and probably like a lot of people who are associated with your success book club, you know, we're always sort of reminding ourselves of things, is that, and I'm, I'm going to read it right now, that I am responsible for my efforts. I am not responsible for the outcome of those efforts. So my responsibility is to show up every day and write to show up every day and do the interview with Richard and, and all the people with the Success Book Club and to do all of the other things that I need to do to enable the possibility of success. Uh, you've got to work for it. You've got to work for it. You know, it's like these, it's like these boxing champions, right? I don't know if you're a boxing fan. I'm a huge boxing fan. Those guys I don't really respect them. It's the old, amazing the work. But the thing is, these guys, they'll tell you that they don't win the match in the ring against their opponent. They win the match six weeks earlier, getting up at 5 a.m. to run 10 miles and then do all of the road work. That's where they went. They won the match way back then. Yeah. And then all they had to do, you know, they were responsible for their efforts. All they had to do then was to, uh, you know, be open to that outcome that they had prepared for. Amazing. And I believe so. This. Yeah, it's so amazing to have a real tangible evidence now that's going to be coming out on May the 20th. So you, you mentioned feeling. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. One thing that I'm really 
interested in. What did it feel like when you stood on that set and you were like, I wrote the book that has now been made into a movie which Mark Wahlberg is going to star in? What, what did that feel like? I was scared to death. <laughs> I was absolutely oh, I... terrified. And the thing is, it, it, you have to put this into context. I am not, I don't frighten. I, I don't rattle. Uh, you know, I, I routinely speak in front of crowds of thousands of people. Yeah. And, you know, I've, and, and even like with little to no preparation, you know, you know just yeah. wind me up and go and you, you point them at, at the crowd and, and then I speak. But as we were leaving London and we drove to the set, which was about uh, 60 kilometers northwest of London in a little town called, little village called Tring. Uh -huh. Which and, I've uh, been to, funny enough. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> it's a small world because that's a yeah. small village. It certainly is, yeah. Um, and and they, they, they have, uh, uh, north of the village, there's, uh, there's an old Rothschild family mansion. And, and they, they end up filming a lot of period pieces there, Downton Abbey, Bridgerton, things like that. And they filmed uh, a couple of scenes from Infinite there. And as we left London, and you leave early in the morning because movie making, I don't know if people know this, this is a hard job, right? And it's, it takes a lot of people doing a lot of different things in harsh conditions. And these guys start at like four or five in the morning. So when you're going to go to be on the movie set, it's early. Um, so we left, it was dark. And we, as we were driving, as we arrived, the sun was coming up. And, it, and Richard, as we got closer and closer, I got more and more nervous. And I got, I got, I got so nervous that I, I couldn't hold a, I couldn't hold a cup of tea in my hand. And can I ask, were you nervous? Was it about meeting the ce celebrities, let's say, such as Mark Wahlberg, or was it about seeing your creation or how your creation was going to look? Like, what was it that was actually scary? It was mostly the latter. It was, it was like, it was weird. It was like meeting that future self that I had always visualized and tried to work toward. And it's like, holy cow, this day is here. And it was, it was just like vibrating with, with energy and excitement. And, and, and also I was nervous, right? I didn't, I, I had no idea how these big Hollywood producers would treat me and how these, um, you know, these really accomplished Hollywood actors would treat me. Richard, they were the best. Um, you know, the driver dropped me off and said, Hey, you ask for, um, you know, Mark Baratian when you get up there, I'm like, geez, Mark Baratian, that guy's made this movie and this movie and this movie, get up there. Nicest guy in the world, Eric, we've been waiting for you. Come here. You know, and he brought me into the producer's tent with the chairs where they look at the monitor and they have the headphones on and they're watching the movie being shot live. And then Lorenzo de Bonaventura, who's produced, you know, amazing movies, right? He's like one of Hollywood's biggest producers nicest guy in the world spent two days with me and my wife basically talking about how movie making is american manufacturing right this is like this is hollywood manufacturing they're manufacturing entertainment vehicles fascinating guy warmest guys in the world met mark Wahlberg, uh just the most down-to-earth professional guy met him first thing he says to me richard looks me in the eye and said eric I hope to make you proud with my portrayal of your character. Wow. And I just wow. like, I was just like flittering away. I could have just floated away, right? The rest of the day, <laughs> like I wasn't even sure. touching the ground. Yeah, they were just so amazing. It was such a wonderful experience. They put me at ease and it was, it was fantastic. But yeah, I was terrified going on set, yeah. Richard. Yeah, so um, I can't wait to see the movie. And I know from speaking to you before that you haven't actually seen the movie. I have not. So how does that feel like now, counting the days until the 28th of May <laughs> to actually see your production? What does that right. feel like? Right. Well, um, it, it, it's exciting. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, and it feels, um, it feels very rewarding to have other professionals um, in, but in a, in a sort of a parallel industry, you know, book, you know, book writing is one and book publishing is one industry, you know, Hollywood is another, they're both in the, inter, you know, they're both entertainment focused, but having all of those people, Antoine Fuqua, Lorenzo de Bonaventura, Ian Shore, John Zalzierni, Rafi Crone, Mark Veradian, all, you know, Mark Wahlberg, all choose 
this project to yeah. do a movie adaptation of it's it's it feels amazing it feels validating it feels so good it feels so rewarding now you know the movie is you know they're they're they're, uh, they're they're almost always different from the book and i think this one will be too but i'm really curious to see uh you know their take on a lot of the philosophical themes in the book and uh and to see what they do with it and i'm just very excited about it and the movie's infinite and it should be in theaters this summer. Yeah, for sure. So just one other question around that. And then, um, yeah, we'll talk about the, the sequels. I'm keen to get into that as well. <laughs> so just, just quickly, though, in um, terms of this time, another thing struck me about the book okay. was how this is a kind of subject that is really quite current for the world today. I think a lot of people in this pandemic are kind of, um, they're doing a bit of soul searching, let's say. So it's come at a, I mean, the timing is really interesting as well, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I believe me, I would not have scripted it this way. I would not have, uh, I would not have written it this way, Richard, for sure. I would have, I would have had a, a very, uh, would have had an easier vehicle to get there than what we've all had to go through for the last 12 or 13 months. Yeah. But yeah, it is, you know, it's funny. Um, I don't know about you and in, in your, in your, in your book club um, um, uh, people, but I've had a lot of time to reflect on the decisions that I've made in my life because, you know, you're, you're living with them on a daily basis, like almost like under house arrest for a year. Yeah. And I'm thinking about, you know, the relationships that I have. I'm thinking about the decisions that I made, um, thinking about the decisions that I should make going forward and thinking about thinking a lot about the house that I live in. And, you know, and, you know, is this where I want to live? Uh, should, I, should I live somewhere else? It really has been a very introspective time. And uh, I don't know about you, or I don't know about your, uh, the, you know, the people in the book club. Um, I'm pretty happy with my decisions. I feel pretty good about them. Uh, but I can see where I want to course correct and, and, um, and the lessons that I've learned and how I want to sort of pay those forward or or give those to a future version of myself almost like a future incarnation of myself you know this is something that 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 we talked about briefly before we started was how the idea of reincarnation like if you like if reincarnation were real and you knew that you would come back what investments would you make in yourself in this lifetime that you would be that you knew you would be able to enjoy in the future would you give yourself additional knowledge? Would you give yourself additional wealth that you could inherit again in a future version of Richard? But we're all really like that in our lives now. You know, I can write books because I studied Russian literature in university 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Right? So in a way, I've paid that forward like a dividend to you know, 2021 Eric from, you know, 1991 Eric. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely amazing. I love that concept because I think most of us, especially nowadays, whenever, you know, careers aren't linear, you know, pe there's much more portfolio careers around and, you know, people do move around much more. So that's a really, really interesting idea. Thank you so much for that. So yeah, I'm so looking forward to the movie coming out on May the 28th. I, can't, I honestly cannot wait just to see what it's all like. I'm so intrigued as to what's going to be in it, what's going to be left out, like you said, and what's, you know, how they adapt, especially the spiritual side of things. But tell us a bit about your plans now. You mentioned uh, a little sneaky uh, bit of knowledge there about a, about a sequel. Tell us a bit about that. So, yeah, there is a sequel and uh, it picks up um, about 18 years after the Reincarnationist Papers and it picks up a lot of the characters um, in the current day and continues, um, uh, continues their progression. And it reintroduces one of the characters that I mentioned briefly in the first book, which is their, uh, which is the Cognomena, which is the secret society that all these people belong to. Uh, it brings back the Cognomena's arch enemy. Mm -hmm. Wow with implications for the cognomena and for implications for all of humanity. Wow. Yeah. 
very interesting. Very interesting indeed. And you mentioned a series. How many is in the series? Uh, there'll be at least three in the series, probably as many as four or five, but at least at least one more after the book that I'm finishing now. Wow, fantastic. So Eric, I'm conscious of your time. So thank you so, so I feel so amazingly blessed to experience this interview because of, I love the book, the content, but actually honestly more so just the whole persistence, the vision, the visioneering it's taken to get it to a movie. I find it absolutely uh, fascinating. So tell me, where could people find you if they want to check out more of your your work keep in touch just to make sure they don't they don't lose track of stuff that's coming down the line where could they find you yeah the best place is uh i'm on i'm on facebook i'm on twitter but the actual best place is at ericmicrans.com that's e r i c m a i k r a n z Dot com. Um, and there is an insiders reader club there. Uh, and if you sign up on the homepage, uh, I'll give you access to some additional insider only information. Things like uh, there's a there's a there's a prequel novella to the reincarnationist papers. Okay. There's also uh, I have a couple of hidden chapters that uh, that I didn't put in the reincarnationist papers that you can get by signing up to my reader group. Uh, and you can do that at ericmicrans.com. Brilliant. I will definitely be doing that. That sounds fascinating. I haven't read the book for sure. So I'll be doing that. And then we'll put those links around wherever you're watching this video. Uh, you'll see the links above or below wherever it is. And uh, yeah, click on those and uh, yeah, get, get involved. So Eric, once again, thank you so much. I cannot wait to see the movie and uh, read the, the sequels as well. So thank you so, so much. This has been All right. amazing. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for having me. And uh, good luck, everybody. And keep working toward your success. You'll get there. Thank you. Thanks.